completely out of our problems. And that summarizes to giving health, education, agriculture, justice, and constitutional reform with local government, local governance, and revenue enhancing sectors like tourism. If you can just hand over those six key sectors, and of course, education, six, seven core competencies to local government, to a local elected government that takes responsibility of these seven key sectors, health, education, agriculture, um, justice, so the whole legal system, the constitutional reform, um, local government, you know, public administration at local level, infrastructure development at the local level. These are seven key issues that are bread and butter issues for the local population. And of course, security, policing. It brings it up to seven or eight departments that take full responsibility. Then you can keep national defense as a national competency. You can keep the, the, the bigger strategic international relations and diplomacy as a national competency. Of course, national government as a national competency. Um, intelligence as a shared competency because you cannot have a policing at a local level that uh, effectively does coordination without sharing intelligence at the national level for national security linked to a defense cluster. A defense cluster that is isolated from civilian life. Isolated from civilian life so that soldiers do not have a responsibility and have nothing to do with local civilian politics. They have republican responsibilities, national defense, a professional army that takes care of external threats. Not a, an army that chooses to show, turn its gun on its people and chooses to show its strength on its people. There's a problem with that conceptualization. Governance. So this is the ideal that would solve, in my opinion, 50% of our problems. This is an ideal that is relevant. Whether we push for the restoration of a two-state federation or we secure outright independence. The pursuit of such an ideal does not contradict, in my sense, the pursuit of independence, because it is zeroing in the focus at two different levels. The assumption of the independence movement, which could be fallacious, is the notion that the attainment of outright independence, if it was attainable, would automatically translate by handing over power to a new generation of southern Cam of leaders of southern Cameroonian origin who are going to automatically put in place laws and build a society that caters for these bread and butter issues. And that's a gamble. It's a gamble in the sense that there are sufficient examples of liberation movements around the world. Let's start only in Africa. Next door, Zimbabwe with Zeno PF, Frelimo in Mozambique, African National Congress in South Africa, who have successfully conducted liberation war, secured independence, been propelled to power, and then in the process of executing governance, that is the consequence or the next step beyond liberation, realize that they do not take care of the interests of the people that they fought to liberate. Robert Mugabe, liberator par excellence. He is a classical example, and let's shame, I like him personally as an individual because of the bold stance that he took on a number of issues. But 
We did the governance narrative. Mugabe is one person that was in the trenches, fought the wars, secured independence, ended up in government. Which meant he was given political power and economic resources to produce the transformation that he spent all of his young life fighting for. We know where Zimbabwe is today. It did not automatically transform to improved outcomes for the citizens. It did not. In South Africa, the African National Congress fought with the trenches. The NC has been in power for the last 25 years. South Africa only has the luck or the advantage that the kind of settler colonialism that operated in this country built huge stock of wealth such that the inefficiencies of the government is not apparent because of their point of departure. If this South Africa was a South Africa that took over South Africa as a country with a black government for the last 25, getting to 30 years, with not the kind of industrial sophistication or the development of the financial markets that collection or the existence of private capital as we have here, South Africa would have been going down the route of Zimbabwe from all indications. The point I'm making is that liberation movements do not automatically translate to good government. There are enough examples for us to see, which when you apply it in the context of the current Southern Cameroonians case, is to say that there is no guarantee. Not to question the intentions of the people who have said that they're going to do better. Not to question their ability, but to say that it's no guarantee. And saying there's no guarantee is to say that changing our attention to start lobbying and fighting and advocating for the kind of change that narrows down and zeroes in on the bread and butter issues, local level institutional reform that brings about devolution of power to the local level, empowering local communities to take responsibility of their own development may not be a conversation that is too early to have. I don't want to break, even uh, address the point where the competencies of all the people who for the last six odd years have put up their hands to fight for our liberation. The limitations that have been demonstrated in the understanding of the working of international relations and politics, in their understanding of people management, in their understanding of being able to just conduct a successful resistance movement or revolution war that takes the interests of the people had had in their understanding of fighting for the people while having the people on your side. Which brings me back to the question of the kidnapping of Regina Mundi. Now, Regina Mundi is, is, is going to represent for, for, the, for the Ambazonian movement, for the Southern Cameroonian quest for restoration, for the whole struggle, as we want to put it, a defining moment, a defining moment from an ideological perspective, because it raises a fundamental question. Is it okay to kidnap or to deprive of liberty an 80 year old woman, 80 and beyond, I speak under correction, who is a mother and a grandmother to us as a people? When I say mother and grandmother to us, this is our this is our this is our mother, this is our auntie, this is our um, grandmother. This is this is one of us. This is one of us. She's as Southern Cameroonian as she gets. We are then faced with a fundamental moral question that says: Do the our aspirations for restoration justify within a globally sensitive? context that has respect for gender rights, specifically the rights of women, do the pursuit of the restoration quest sufficiently justify the kidnapping and depriving of liberty of an 80-year-old woman because of her associations with the government of Cameroon? This is going to be our undoing. This is going to be our undoing and the undoing of the so-called restoration quest. 
Because when it boils down to such a question of morality, we disagree. A lot of people think that, no, you have to pursue your quest with a deliberate intention to maintain a superior moral authority. It is in it, in the pursuit of liberation movements, to bedevil the opponent and paint yourself in a positive light. That holds the, 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 that holds the essence of the promise of a better life and the creation of a better society that you are fighting for. You cannot divorce yourself from the moral authority of presenting a superior moral ethical standard in your quest. You cannot. The reason you cannot do that is because you are in a course to conquer the support and the hearts of the people that you are fighting for. It is not a given. It is not a given.